Urbino in northern Italy, better known to us foreign tourists, I suppose, as Turin. It was once the capital of Italy, and it was from this palace here behind me that the Savoy family, who were the monarchs of the day, ruled. And they were the family who were responsible for uniting the whole of Italy, eventually moving the capital from Torino to Rome. The whole area began to develop in the 17th and 18th century, and today it's best known for its fine wines, superb Italian cuisine, and equally superb motor cars. So good were the cars, in fact, that Henry Ford once said that every time he saw an Alfa Romeo, he raised his hat, which is not surprising when one considers the history and the tradition of the Italian manufacturer. If you know your motoring history, and in particular that of Alfa Romeo, then you'll recognize this motor car here. This is the 158 Grand Primo, and it's the most successful Formula One racing car of all time. Between 1938 and 1950, this car scored 29 Grand Prix victories. And in fact, in the year 1950, it won every single Grand Prix race, driven by Nino Farina, and of course the legendary Juan Manuel Fangio. Well, the story of Alfa Romeo isn't just one about Grand Prix success. It's the story of a motor manufacturer which more than once found itself on the brinks of bankruptcy, and which, like the proverbial phoenix, rose from the ashes to become one of the great giants of the modern motor manufacturing industry. At the turn of the century, the European motor manufacturing industry was still in its infancy, and in Italy it was almost unborn. But cars were becoming a fascination for the Italians, even if the early arrivals could only manage to run from Milan to Rome at an average speed of about nine and a half miles an hour. In those days, the carefree Italians could hardly have suspected that the future would see the homegrown motor manufacturing industry becoming something of a legend throughout the world. And Alfa Romeo was to become an integral part of that legend. I suppose you could say that this is where the Alfa Romeo story began, but not quite. This isn't an Alfa Romeo, this is a Dirac, a French car. And in 1906, Dirac opened up a manufacturing business here in Milano, and became one of the first motor manufacturers to start in this part of the world. This 1906 version had a 1500cc two-cylinder engine, and it was capable of a top speed of 40 kilometers an hour. But in 1910, the company went bankrupt and they were taken over by an organization whose initials were ALFA. And that's where the real story of Alfa Romeo began. The initials ALFA stand for Anonima Lombarda Fabrica Automobili. And this was one of the first cars that were produced by Alfa. This was a four liter grand touring monster. It's one of the most comfortable cars I've ever sat in, incidentally far more comfortable than a lot of modern-day motor cars. It had a four-liter engine, and it was capable of a top speed of 100 kilometers an hour. But the badging on the front still says Alfa Milano. The name Alfa Romeo didn't appear until the end of the First World War. Well, by 1913, Alfa were already on the racing circuits of Europe with cars like this. This one had a massive six-liter engine, yet despite the size of the engine, its top speed was only 150 kilometers an hour. But it must have been some fairly spectacular and hairy racing, because this car had no front brakes. There is a pedal for the driver there, but the power from that is transmitted to the massive drums on the rear. So you can imagine what sort of hairy racing that produced, particularly braking on entering corners. At the beginning of the First World War, Alfa were making military vehicles. But by 1915, they were in financial trouble. And the company was bought by a Neapolitan businessman by the name of Nicola Romeo. And that's where the name Romeo crept in to the whole mark. It appeared on cars like this, a 1920 ES with a 4.25 litre engine and a top speed of 130 kilometres an hour grand touring classic of its day. But Alfa Romeo's woes were far from over. But those days were still quite a bit off, and during the 20s, Alfa Romeo had plenty of successes. It's cars like the 1500 here, cars like the Orel Supersport built for the 1927 Millimilia, and cars like this Supersport model, which was built with a special metalwork 
and a special paint job for an Indian prince. But then, towards the end of the 20s, the world was hit by the Great Depression, and Europe suffered just as much as did the United States of America. By then, Mussolini had taken over Italy, and he formed a company known as IRI, the I or I. Now, this was a sort of industrial development company, which was designed basically to assist and to prop up companies which were floundering as a result of the Depression. And one of those companies was Alfa Romeo. It was taken over by the state in 1928, and it remained in state hands until 1987, when it was bought by Fiat. Today, Fiat and Alfa Romeo are part of one of the biggest motoring conglomerations in northern Italy. Perhaps the real legend of the mark established itself on the racetracks of Europe. The philosophy throughout the company's history has been to successfully race cars which were built for ordinary people. That philosophy continues today in touring car championships. Alfa Romeo, of course, have pulled out of Formula One racing. But one Alfa Romeo Formula One car made an indelible impression on the face of Formula One, and it's still there 50 years later. And this was the car that did it. This was the Tipo 512, which was introduced back in 1940. It had a 1500cc engine, and it was capable of reaching speeds of up to 350 kilometers an hour. But for the life of me, I can't even begin to fathom how men could race in machines like this. The cockpit is incredibly cramped. It's got a huge steering wheel, and they didn't have things like four-point seat harnesses or safety belts in those days. All they had for protection was a fairly primitive sort of crash helmet and a set of goggles. Those were the days when racers probably had colorful scarves blowing in the wind as well. But this car, as I said, revolutionized Formula One racing because for the first time, the 12-cylinder engine was now mounted in the rear of the car. It started a trend in 1940, and it's a trend that's continued right up to 1995. Well, no motor museum would be worth its salt if it didn't have some sort of a South African connection, and this is it. This is a 1929 1750 Supersport, and cars like this and its predecessors were driven to victory in a string of European motorsport events between 1927 and 1929. Now, this particular model was driven to victory in the 1929 Mille Miglia by two Italian drivers, Giuseppe Campari and Giulio Ramponi. Ramponi was the co-driver, he was the mechanic, and it was his job to monitor fuel and oil pressure and to help change the gears on what was a fairly grueling event in those days, particularly in a car like this. Ramponi was a mechanic at Alfa Romeo, and when he retired, he chose to spend his final years in South Africa, where he died about eight or nine years ago. This is the Piazza San Carlo in the heart of Torino. It's one of the most elegant squares in the city, and it's surrounded on all sides by the best restaurants and the best shops. The statue behind me here was erected to the memory of a gentleman by the name of Emanuele Filberto, who was one of the ancient princes of the Savoy royal family. Now, as you can see, his form of transport in those days, although quite formidable looking, certainly wasn't anything as elegant as the forms of transport which they're used to in this part of the world today. Forms of transport like the Alfa Romeo 164 Super. And this is one of the cars we've come to take a look at here in Turin and in Milan. Because these cars from the Alfa Romeo and Fiat stable are going to be imported to South Africa by automakers the holding company of Nissan, South Africa. The Alfa Romeo 164 first saw the light of day back in 1984, when this heavily disguised version started a series of pre-production tests to determine its strengths and weaknesses under a variety of conditions and climates. On the 9th of January 1995, the 164 began its Arctic Circle testing in Lapland. This is an area much favoured by European manufacturers for their cold weather testing, but for the 164 it was merely one of a series of tests which would take the vehicle over a total of one million kilometres from northern Italy to the Arctic, through central Europe and Italy again, and on to the scorching heat of the northern Sahara and Morocco. 
150 test drivers put the 164 through its paces in one of the most exhaustive pre-production testing sessions ever undertaken. This is a car which is in the luxury class and it has all the features which you'd expect from a car of this nature. Looks, power and prestige. Our drive in the 164 in Italy included a high speed hop from Milan to Turin on the Autostrada and at 180 kilometers an hour the 164 isn't even doing its best. It's simply cruising along and there's a lot more under the accelerator pedal if you need it. In fact the top speed on this one is around the 240 mark. Unfortunately the Italian police don't take lightly to high speed testing on their autostradas let alone anywhere else. The exhaustive testing done on the 164 has been put to very good use. Data recorded on the road was fed into a computer and the 164 was rigged up and connected to the program. In this way the engineers at Alfa Romeo were able to simulate more kilometers in the test facility, putting the car through the equivalent of another 500,000 kilometers of extremely rough driving. Independent McPherson struts here for the front suspension with lower wishbones and a roll bar and the same at the back with transverse links and reaction arms thrown in for good measure. And of course power steering makes this one a very light and easy car to handle in and around town. There are also plenty of safety features on the 164. Side impact protection has been included in the doors to protect the occupants in the event of a T-bone impact. There's an airbag mounted in the steering wheel for the driver and the front and rear disc brakes have an anti-lock braking system as a standard. But it's probably under the bonnet that the real fun's to be found. There are several versions of the car available in Europe including a turbo diesel. But we expect to see the 164 in South Africa in either or both the 2 and 3 litre V6 versions. The 3 litre V6 produces 152 kilowatts at 6,300 RPM and 270 newton meters of torque at 5,000 revs. And that'll see the top speed flatten out, as we said, at about the 240 kilometer an hour mark. From a standing start, the 3 litre will hit the ton in 8 seconds. The fuel consumption isn't that high. We'll get about 9.41 litres per 100 k's at a steady 120 kilometers an hour. The other power unit comes in the form of the 2 litre V6 petrol engine, the T-Spark unit, as Alpha call it. And this pushes out 105 kilowatts at 5,800 revs, a maximum torque of 187 newton meters at 5,000 RPM. Top speed here levels off at 210 kilometers an hour, with the 100 kilometer an hour mark coming up from a standing start in 9.9 .9 seconds. Once again, the fuel consumption figures are pretty good, as low as 6.5 liters per 100 kilometers if you keep the speed at a steady 90 and 8.3 litres at the legal limit of 120. The only problem is that the temptation to exceed that limit will always be there. Remember back to the old days when Alfa Romeo were in this country, they had a slogan which is still as true today as it was then. This car is licensed to thrill. This is the posh bit of Torino. In these villas here in the hills behind me are where the rich people of Torino live the presidents of the major companies down in the city below. The sort of people who can afford the types of cars that I'm going to show you now. If you cast your mind back to Kyalami Racing Circuit, the old circuit towards the end of the 70s and the 80s, and you think about the saloon car racing in those days, you will remember a line of Mazda Capellas going down the main straight line abreast. Well, invariably stuck in amongst them was young Arnold Chats in his Alpha GTV. Well, this is the new Alpha GTV, the 1995 version, and it's available in two and three liter versions. The version you see here at the moment is just the left-hand drive version, but it will be available in South Africa in a right-hand drive derivative. More than any other manufacturers anywhere in the world, one thing that the Italians are synonymous for is the design and building of the greatest sports cars in the world. Back in the early 60s, Alfa Romeo came up with the design for a two-seater sports car which was to become something of a legend. It became almost a cult car, the sort of car which any Alfa Romeo fan would like to find in his or her Christmas stocking. The car, of course, was the Spider. 
and this is the 1995 derivative of that car. And like its predecessors ever since the early 60s, it still carries the design signature of Pininfarina. And it also carries the tradition and history of the Alfa Romeo mark. The spider story probably goes back to a prototype Giulietta spider which was built in 1955. And then the Giulietta of 1966 later on. But in the 60s it was the spider which claimed the hearts of the Alfisti almost as much as the GTV. The new cars though are absolutely superb and there could be no doubt that they'll prove to be as popular with the South African Alfisti as the previous models did. Once again, the power units here will probably be the 2 and 3 litre V6 units, and there's everything you're likely to need in the way of safety and performance here. We did manage a trip on the Autostrada in the GTV, but I'm afraid torrential rain did the same job as the Italian police in making sure we kept to the legal limit, if of course there really is such a thing in Italy. What really impressed us about the GTV is the fact that you don't feel cooped up in the car despite its size. And that applies as much to the Spider, which is really the soft top version of the GTV. Both cars are surprisingly spacious and the visibility all round is extremely good. There's a choice of cloth and leather upholstery available as well if you want a little more opulence. In true Alpha tradition, the instrumentation is well laid out and it does tell you that you're driving a sports car. Only the Japanese manufacturers of so-called sports cars learnt a lesson from the Italians. The Spider and the GTV handle like they should, like real sports cars and just like their predecessors. The acceleration in the cars is sometimes quite mind-blowing. and There's also a lovely throaty note from the exhaust which once again tells you something about what it is you're driving. One criticism though, as far as the soft top spider is concerned, and that's getting the top up and down. This is a two-man operation. It's about the only real fault we could detect during our short stay with the car. Still, it looks like this, you'll have plenty of friends to help. The engine compartment with the V6 engine still, we're happy to say, looks like an engine compartment and not like somebody's idea of how a V6 should be Christmas wrapped. Here you can see what you're getting at, even though I still wouldn't relish the prospect of being forced to tinker with anything down here. So, taken all round, you can forget your Armani suits from the local boutiques of Milano and Torino. I'll go for a made-to-measure Spider or GTV any day of the week. And we're already looking forward to getting behind the wheel of the right-hand drive versions when they arrive in South Africa, which will probably be early next year. To say the least, the Spider has certainly changed its style, and we think it's a lot more attractive than the previous models. That style and design is something which has emerged from the collaboration between Alfa Romeo and Pininfarina, and months of hard work at the Alfa Romeo Design and Styling Center in Milan. And when we got the invitation to visit the design center with our TV camera, it was certainly something which we weren't going to turn down. Well, I think as you can see, there's an awful lot of planning goes into the style and design of every Alfa Romeo motor car, certainly from the new models that we've seen. And here at the Milano headquarters, they believe in bringing in fresh blood every once in a while to aid in that whole design process. They bring in students from universities, from technicons, and from art schools, just to add a little bit of freshness. Thereafter, the cars go through the usual design process of computer-aided design, up to scale models, and eventually up to full-scale models, until eventually they become fully equipped, brand new motor cars, like this one here behind me, which has not even been revealed as yet. And it's here in this vast television-like studio auditorium that even the management of Alfa Romeo sometimes get to glimpse the new cars for the very first time. But how long does it take for a new Alfa Romeo to get from that first concept on the drawing board to a fully completed car? Well, that's a question I put to the director of the Alfa Romeo Design Center, Walter De Silva. Ma ormai il, il, il tempo di... Nowadays, the time involved in designing a new car is fairly short. In about 36 months, 
We can design a project starting from a blank sheet of paper. But of course, it's clear that in the case of the Alfa Romeo, this is not simply a matter of ready, steady, go. Rather, it is something which is still carrying on the history of our models. Therefore, we are always training, because as soon as we decide to go ahead with a new model, we must be ready for the race. We must be ready for the competition from other car manufacturers. But generally speaking, it takes about 36 months to make a new model. Now, we've got a car like the GTV, which is ultra-modern in its styling. How long did that particular car take to, to reach what it has done today? Concerning the GTV and the Spider, it has been a collaboration with Pininfarina. Firstly, we worked on a model called the Protero, which we used to research our message of design and style through the world. After that, we rapidly defined the concept of the first model, the concept of the GTV and the Spider. Then we took it to the Alfa Romeo Style Center, and then we began the development of the model until it reached production. So, in real terms, it took us about four years. But I must also say that we were not only designing one car, but a range of models. We were designing the 145, the 146, the Spider, and the GTV. So we had to look at the personality of each and every model. And it was very important to keep the whole range under control in order for the image of our trademark to be strongly recognizable in these new models. Therefore, we also needed the time to put together not only one single model, but all four models. And as always, one of our most important considerations throughout the design stages had to be our strict adherence to our corporate image, something which had to be observed, not only with the GTV and the Spider, but all four models. Also set for our shores in the not too distant future is a car which has been carving up the touring car racing circuits. It's the 155 T-Spark. And even my friend Max here loved it. Now this one's been around for a while, but since its launch a few years ago, it's already undergone a lot of refinement. In Europe, they've added a 1.7 litre petrol engine to the range, and they've got two potent turbo diesels. Which ones will arrive in South Africa? Well, we're still waiting to hear about it, but it'll probably be with a two litre capacity. The 1.7 is available in petrol form, and that's one which we like the sound of power output of the engine is 83 kilowatts at 5,800 rpm and the maximum torque is 146 newton meters at 3,500. What's interesting here about the 1.7 engine is that the torque remains practically constant between two and a half thousand and five and a half thousand revs and it's actually higher than a similar 1.8 liter derivative. The T-Spark motors are also extremely reliable and they require very little maintenance. And with a top speed of 191 kilometers an hour from the 1.7 liter version, there's plenty of the Alfa Romeo sporty tradition in the 155. Even if zero to 100 in a shade under 12 seconds won't get you too excited. The 155 also has a rather unique electronic suspension adjustment system, which automatically adjusts the setting to suit the type of surface you happen to be riding on at the time. And all this, as we said right at the beginning of the program, is part of the tradition of Alfa Romeo, who race cars which they build for people, the people they call the Alfisti. So together with the 145, the 146 and the GTV, this then has been the lineup of Alfa Romeo models bound for South Africa. And there's no doubt about it that it's a very impressive lineup indeed. Apart from the power and performance of the cars, you also have the prestige and the pedigree of a top automaker like Alfa Romeo. 
And now with the backup of automakers in South Africa, Alfa Romeo fans can rest assured that they're going to have a full parts and backup service for the Alfa Romeo cars. And that just about brings us to the end of this week's program. I'm Alan Johnson. Thanks for being with us. Until the same time next week, don't forget those seatbelts. <laughs>